I want to start off with a prayer. God put this message on my heart for a very specific reason. One of which is this has been one of my weakest areas as a Christian. So often God will teach other people through teaching me. And this is certainly something that I've had to lean into, lean into the discomfort. So today is about understanding different types of of prayer and meditation, ways to connect with God, some of which may look a little silly, some of which may be misinterpreted by people around you. God wants you to be willing to do it anyways. So let's all close our eyes, tap in. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this Sunday. Thank you so much for this message. We're so grateful that we have the ability to connect direct with you, that we don't need anybody else. You're here for us with us in every moment, in every breath. You breathed your breath into us. You made us in your image, Lord. You gave us that one-on-one connection, and I just ask that you restore that connection to anyone in this room today that feels that it's been cut or it's missing. God, I ask that you move boldly in their life. You show yourself to them. You show them your nature. You show them your face, your voice. God, I ask that you meet them in every moment of their day, especially when they're feeling disconnected. God, I know that you have something special today for us with this message. Thank you for being here. Thank you for bringing us here. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, everybody. God kept highlighting a couple different scriptures. So over the next couple of days, we're going to be building a few of them in together. So he highlighted 1 Samuel 1 through 3. So books and chapters 1 through 3. Hey, welcome. Welcome. And he also highlighted 1 Kings. So we're going to be going through both 1 Kings, we're going to be going through Isaiah, and we're also going to be going through 1 Samuel. Not today. Today we're going to be focusing on Samuel, but often when God reveals something to me, imagine if you ever took kind of more rudimentary sewing, you know, and you know how to do kind of like the running stitch. Does everyone remember the simple running stitch before it got real advanced? So Right, when a stitch goes down, it disappears for a second, then it pops back up, yeah, and then it goes back down, disappears, and comes back up. God will often reveal messages to me like that running stitch where it shows where one thread pops up, and then he'll show me where that connects back again. So I believe over the next three sessions, we're going to be tracking this kind of running stitch of a message that God has for us. Today, really starting foundationally with different types of prayer and ways that we personally have to move out of shame and a desire for it to look and feel a certain way for us to really step into what God has called us to do. So let's start by framing this up with 1 Samuel. We are in verses 1 through 20. Now, Eli the priest was sitting on his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. And I should mention, previous to this section, it's talked about how in these days, not many people had revelation of God, right? So this was a very dry period. It's not like today where everyone's got the Holy Spirit, everyone's pulling down revelation, everyone's dropping in prophetic words. It says that this was a dry period where there were only a select few that were able to hear from God. And guess what? Eli was one of them. So to set that into mind, right, Eli would have been one of the most connected people to God. Now watch this. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. And she made a vow saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life and no razor will ever be used on his head. So to give you a little context here. Hannah is married to a man that has two wives, right? She's the other wife. The previous wife has had lots of kids, but the husband actually loves this wife the most, right? So the husband loves Hannah the most. The other wife's giving him lots of kids. And he actually loves this wife so much that even though he's going to do sacrifices and keep asking the Lord to open up her womb, he actually goes to her and tells her, like, I love you so much, even if he doesn't open up your womb, like, you're still my favorite. You're my favorite wife. It's a little weird. He's got two wives, but we'll leave that to the side. So you're my favorite wife, even though your womb is not open and providing children, okay? So, but Hannah knows how much her husband loves her, and all she wants to do is be able to provide him with a child. So she's sitting here weeping. As she kept 
On praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart, and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk and said to her, how long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. I ask you this. Obviously, this was, as the Lord says in this book of the Bible, a dry period where not many people were able to hear accurately the voice of God. Eli was one of a very few. Still, he misinterpreted this happening right in front of him. Has anyone ever had their walk with God or the way they connect with God misinterpreted by other people? Right? That doesn't feel very good. And there's a deep innate part of us as human beings that want to feel included or safe with our peers. It's part of our tribal genetic makeup. In times long ago, if people in our tribe didn't trust us or didn't want us around, our lives were at risk, right? We actually had to depend on our group for survival. So it's somewhere deep in our DNA that we want to be liked and trusted and held in high regard by our peers. So often the way God has us move and act in our daily lives is not understood by the people around us. And often I find we tend to compartmentalize. I think People go into maybe their prayer closet or they try to pray very silently and very still and they're like, I don't want anyone to know what I'm doing. Do we think this is what God's asking us to do? Hide? Go hide away in a closet? Honey, I hope that you don't mind me sharing this, but Gordon, he's like a very powerful prayer warrior. And when you do pray, you can actually feel it in the house. And somehow I won't even know that you're doing it. And I'm just like prompted to go near it. And then you'll see me and notice me while you're praying. And all of a sudden it's like this awkward moment, like, excuse me, I was praying. <gasps> okay. And it brings up that song. Um, I think it's a Brandon Lake song, Talking to Jesus, right? There's this part of the song where the son bumps into him and the father's like probably praying in tongues. And the son's like, oh, I'll come back a little later. And he's like, no, come on in. This is like, you're, you're supposed to see this. We have this kind of fear and shutdown where we're like, it's too vulnerable. Having somebody watch you pray, having somebody watch you on your knees worshiping the Lord, it's too much vulnerability for most people. Agree? I feel like God's trying to really break that off of us today. So Eli, one of the few people that can hear from God. This woman is like deeply connected with God. Like, I love my husband so much. Please, I will do anything. Open my womb, open my womb. And he's like, woman, you're drunk. Put your wine away. She says, not so, my Lord. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. So we're clear, not wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my greatest anguish and grief. Eli answered, go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. She said, may your servant find favor in your eyes. Then she went her way and ate something, and her face was no longer downcast. Early the next morning, they arose and worshiped before the Lord, and they went back to their home in Ramah. Elkanah, that's her husband, made love to his wife Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, saying, because I asked the Lord for him. So Samuel in Hebrew means God has heard. Samuel is a pretty important character in the Bible. If you haven't dug deep into First and Second Samuel, I definitely suggest it. Really great books. I think what God wants us to extract from this exchange is that ultimately God's interpretation is the only thing that matters. The only thing you need be concerned with is what God thinks about your prayer, not what somebody else thinks about your prayer. Not what somebody is going to misinterpret or try to shame you for. You know what you're doing with God. Stop seeking external validation. You don't need somebody to tell oh, you. You're good at prayer. You're so, good at, you're so good at praying in tongues. Are we going to have a praying in tongues contest? Is that what God's asking us to do? Because I have been in churches where it seems like they're trying to have a praying in tongues contest. That's not, that's not what God's asking us to do here. Everyone's prayer will look different. Everyone's prayer process might look different. And hey, I think a big picture today that God wants us to get is that 
different types of prayer are required for different seasons of your life, different situations. So I think often we get stuck in something that we believe we're good at or feels comfortable or safe enough. I think God's trying to sit here and mix it up for us a little bit. So with a show of hands, and this goes out to you all at home too, watching from online, who can sometimes feel awkward when you're praying? If you think about it this way, if a bunch of people that you knew weren't Christians were watching you pray, would they be like, ooh, she's crazy, she's talking to nobody? That's a tough pill to swallow for some people, right? You're like sitting there really trying to open yourself up. You know God is real. You want to receive. You want to talk to God. As soon as other people or their opinions or perception is involved, sometimes we just like really go into our little turtle shell. There are different types of prayer that can allow us to, I would say, press into and expand some of the confines we've put on our prayer life. Prayer through worship and song, I think, for a lot of people is the easy one. And maybe not even that easy for some, right? Even in, like, morning worship, some people are like, mm-hmm, hey Other people are like, woo! Some people get down on their knees. There's all different levels. But typically, prayer through worship and song can be the easiest because you're not trying to fill the space with your words, right? There's usually, there are words that you're kind of just allowing yourself to open and receive. Then there's praying in tongues, which, you know, I think no matter where you go, there are going to be people that are like, that's of the devil. And then it's like, well, Paul disagrees, so maybe we should have a deeper convo about that. Praying in tongues is something that we're going to extract a little bit more today and take a look at it because it's one of the ways that I think God's able to create the deepest revelation in you and also break a lot of the confines and restrictions that you put on yourself Right, and it's arguably in some ways one of the most vulnerable things because you sound like you're talking in gibberish, yeah? We've also got prayer walking and dancing. We're going to be looking at a couple of examples of this, namely through David. Movement itself is going to incite action in the spirit realm. And once we get things moving in the spirit realm, the spirit realm is going to come back and incite action in our lives physically. So prayer walking and dancing can be very important. If you know anything about spiritual mapping, it's also important that our feet are touching certain pieces of land as we pray, right? But there's spiritual battle happening at GPS coordinates all over the world. Oftentimes, God will have you go somewhere. You don't know why you're there. God just is like, hey, you, Jeff, feet, here, pray. And you can't be like, I'm not going to pray here in front of all these people. That's like spitting in the face of God, man. You don't want to do that. God has brought me to some random places where I'll be driving in my car, and all of a sudden I'll just hear Holy Spirit be like, we're going to go left. And I'm like, but that's going to take 10 minutes longer. Holy Spirit doesn't care. If that's where your feet are needed or if that's where your prayer is needed, then that's where you are to go. So walking and dancing and movement in general can absolutely be directing prayer. There's also structured prayer, which I find a lot of people can get stuck in because it feels safe, right? If you're just repeating scripture over and over again, I'm not saying don't do it. But I think what I'm saying here, and I think what God's kind of nudging me to say is, are you just playing it safe? Is that simple? Do you trust that process? Do you know how to repeat the scripture over and over again? You're like, this feels like I'm doing something But is it safe or is it what Holy Spirit is actually asking you to do? Because there's a time and a place, but there's also a way that we can let it become a crutch or a hurdle in our spiritual life. Fixed hour prayer. I want to share a little experience I had with fixed hour prayer. A lot of times fixed hour prayer and fasting prayer will go together. So let's say you're doing like a two or three day session of fasting prayer. Often you'll pray at specific times repeatedly, often on the same scripture or a certain type of topic. I've done this, I did a three-day fast once where I was doing fasting prayer and I was praying every three hours for the three days. And what happens is this compounding effect where every time you do it and you kind of meet God in that same place, it's like you're pushing a little bit further, a little bit further. By the time I got to the very last session of my three-day prayer fast, the intensity of meeting with God was so much so that I got physically ill, physically nauseous. I remember going to my bed shaking and just feeling like my whole body was purging something. I never actually purged 
in the physical, but spiritually my body was shaking and something was moving out of me. So there's something to be said for this persistence, right? This set structure where you're just showing up, pressing in, pressing in. It's like going to do a workout and trying to do an exercise to failure. Like how much can you push in to meet with God? I encourage you to try this. Let God lead where and when the timing is for you, but something like this will push and stretch you way out of your comfort zone. Then we've got contemplative prayer, which is obviously sitting and receiving and thinking, processing. So for a lot of Christians, this would be their version of meditation. So we're not meditating on nothing, but we're meditating simply on our connection with God, allowing ourselves to receive right, to just show up and be in his presence without an agenda. How many of you, if you're honest with yourselves, only really go into prayer with an agenda? Sometimes, right? Either an agenda for yourself or an agenda for someone else, right? We go to prayer because somebody's sick and we want to stand and intercede for them, fine. You go to prayer because something's going wrong in your life and you're like, God, give me guidance. How many of you just go into prayer just because? No agenda, just, God, what do you have for me today? I'm ready to receive. That, my friends, is one of the most powerful types of prayer sessions you can have, where you're not in need, right? You don't want something. You're not sitting there like, knock, knock, God, can we transact real quick? You're actually just wanting to be in his presence. Lord, even if you have nothing for me, I just want to spend this time with you. That should be a part of daily life. Then we've got conversational prayer. So, Going back to, again, that example of the song, Talking to Jesus, a lot of people will actually allow themselves to have a conversation with Jesus unfold, right? This is what I would consider more going to Jesus, the example of what we are to do trying to walk out this multi-part life, right? One part spiritual, one part physical. We're coming to a friend or an advisor for guidance, right? I often will go to Father God when I need correction, when I need introspection, to see a bigger picture to what I might be missing. And to Jesus, when I need real life examples, I need, hey, I, where am I in need of repentance? Where am I missing the mark? Where do I need to push harder? That can be that conversational prayer posture. And then we've got silent prayer. I think a lot of people are real good at silent prayer, right? You just sit quietly like this. Because it's comfortable. No one can see what you're doing. Maybe you're, who knows what's happening up in there. But either way, oftentimes, silent prayer is what feels comfy because people aren't going to judge you that much. You don't look wild. You're not getting wild in the spirit. There's nothing coming out of your mouth. You're not moving around. But I think God's question is, is silent prayer because you're shy or is silent prayer because that's what Holy Spirit is guiding you to do? Personally, if I'm really honest with myself, whenever I'm praying very silently, it's because I'm concerned about how other people are going to think or feel about me in the room. It's not actually because that's what God is calling me to do. I can feel the movement stirring in my body. I can feel my breath change. I encourage you to try to find that discernment with Holy Spirit and ask yourself next time, like, is God really asking me to sit here like this? Probably not. Let's take a look at David dancing before the Lord. Again, like with Hannah misinterpreted by Eli, listen, drunk woman, put down your wine. There's another character here that is in deep judgment, in fact, hatred of David for the way David is praising the Lord. So this is 2 Samuel 6. Wearing a linen ephod, David was dancing before the Lord with all his might. While he and all Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the sound of trumpets. As the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michal, daughter of Saul, watched from a window. And when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. Despise is hate. It's a deep level of hate. She despised him in her heart. 
We're skipping forward four verses. When David returned home to bless his household, Michal, daughter of Saul, came out to meet him and said, how the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, going around half naked in full view of the slave girls of his servants as a vulgar fellow would. In case you need another interpretation of that, she basically is like, ew, how dare you? That's so vulgar. How dare the Lord do this? Judgment right? Judgment, anger, hatred. David said to Michal, it was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father or anyone from his house when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people Israel. I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this, and I will be humiliated in my own eyes. But by these slave girls you spoke of, I will be held in honor." This guy's got no shame. He doesn't care what he looks like. He's like, I will dance more, even if that makes all of y'all uncomfortable, because the Lord appointed me to be here, and everyone will honor me as such. He knows who sent him. He knows what his mission is, and he knows what God's called him to do, so he doesn't really care what it looks like. If the Lord was calling you to do what David was doing, do you think you'd have some second thoughts? Do you think he'd be a little bit more timid, maybe come out doing the robot instead of really doing what he was asking you to do? Part of David's prophetic movement, I believe, is what made him such a powerful leader, right? He just, his heart was so big, his willingness to be obedient, even if he was being humiliated seemingly publicly, he was willing to do whatever the Lord asked him to do. Let's take a look at two examples of speaking in tongues. So 1 Corinthians 14, 2, for anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to people, but to God. Indeed, no one understands them. They utter mysteries by the Spirit. Who's actually prayed in tongues before? You should try it. Talk about a vulnerable experience. It's definitely a vulnerable one. One thing that's important, and I encourage all of you to pray about it, have some sessions, see what the Lord is leading you to do here, but don't go trying to listen to other people speak tongues so that you can learn how to speak tongues. This isn't a language. It's not like, like go memorize French so that you can go pray in French. If Holy Spirit is truly giving you utterance, you don't have to go listen to somebody else's utterance to make your utterance sound like that utterance. You hear how silly that sounds, right? And I will hear people do that because they don't want their tongues to sound weird. We've already lost the whole dang thing if that's what you're going for. If the Lord is truly giving you utterance, the whole point is you are not to judge it while it's processing through you. If you are in utterance and you're sitting there critiquing how it sounds, are you actually praying in tongues? I don't think so. When you are praying in tongues, your body, let's say the somatic level of your body and the part of you that is deeply connected to the spirit realm, should be receiving simultaneous interpretation as it's coming out of you, so much so that you are in the presence of God. It doesn't matter what you're saying. You shouldn't even be listening to what you're saying because you are in utterance. When you are in utterance, you're not able to simultaneously listen to yourself. So I encourage you, if you try to go into something like this and see if it's something that God is asking you to move into, and I believe part of today's session was because he does want to unlock this for many of you, don't go into it trying to understand it. Go into it purely with the heart of obedience. Maybe the first sound that comes out is like, ah, whatever. We all start like a baby. <laughs> Doesn't really matter. I think what God establishes within us when we are actually allowing ourselves to be so obedient and vulnerable that utterance comes out is we actually let go of all control. It's one of the most incredible acts of submission, like, Lord, actually take over my voice. It's a tough one. So don't judge or try to dissect or understand what comes out. Just establish that trust relationship with the Lord. Establish that relationship that whatever sound God tries to push out of your body, you just say, yes, here I am, yes, I'm going to do it. I want to prophesy to you today that if you set aside time in your life to press into this, 
God is going to unlock it in a very, very powerful way for you. And I believe that that's part of why God brought us here today. Let's also take a look at Mark 16, 17 through 18. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. I think it's a sad state of affairs that in most churches today, almost every single thing here is like, we don't do that. We do all this, but not that. That's too much. It's too uncomfortable. Everything there is very uncomfortable because it, in many ways, all goes against the natural laws of the natural world. All of these things have the potential to make you look like a nutcase. This is why Jesus reminds us multiple times, like, hey, what I'm going to ask you to do, you can't care about what people think about you because you will look crazy. So I think what God's asking you to do here is to give a little trust fall, push into your boundaries a little bit more. And hey, I'm not saying you got to do this in a public space. You can go do this far off in the wilderness. Many people in the Bible did. You can go do this in a prayer closet. I don't care where you do it, but I do believe that God has an appointment for each one of you to press into this gifting. For some of you, contemplative prayer and meditation is a great place to start. Set aside some time to just be in the presence of God. Set aside some time to just listen. Try to build in some sort of cadence in your week that isn't just going to God with an agenda. When we go to God with our agenda, it often doesn't leave enough room for God to really truly give us what he's trying to give us, right? If we come there with a to-do list, he's faithful, so he's going to meet us there on our to-do list. And then often you're like, well, God, got to go to work. I believe God wants us to build in some time where we don't have an agenda. We're not going with an itemized to-do list. Just receive, be in his presence, and even if you get nothing, be filled up by being in his presence. Conversational prayer for some of you is what God's calling you to do. Conversational prayer in many ways will push your faith. Oftentimes, if we're just saying the same thing over and over, God, I pray for this, I pray for this, I pray for this, right? We're not actually often listening for a response. We're just kind of pushing messages out there, and then we're like, okay, thank you, and then we're out. You're not actually waiting for the response. Conversational prayer is vulnerable and exposing because guess what? You're supposed to sit there and await a response. This goes back to that idea of a parent maybe missing the pickup line a few times and you waiting an extra half hour and all of a sudden every time you go to pickup line, you're like, Ugh, you've got anxiety. What if, mom, what if mom forgets me again? What if mom doesn't show up? A lot of you have that relationship with the Lord. Well, but what if I start a conversation and he doesn't talk back? Has that ever happened to any of you? You want to start a conversation, but you're like deeply afraid that no one's going to answer. Like, how do I know when he answers? I've met with a lot of baby Christians that are like, so how do I know when God's answering me back? Faithfulness, submission, obedience, patience. Patience is the key. Sometimes it takes a second to hear back. And by a second, I mean a lot longer than a second. There have been certain conversations that I've opened with God where I'm like, okay, anytime you want to respond. And sometimes that respond will, the response will be a week later, two weeks later. But we have to be expectant that we will get a response. And I think one key here that God really wants us to get, stop trying to decide what that response is going to sound like or look like. A lot of times we miss God's response because we're expecting it to be this like rumbling in the sky and like, hello, Jeff, I was trying to reach you today. Like, that's not how it's going to happen. So sometimes we get this idea of like, well, I, it's obviously not happening unless it sounds like this. It's obviously not happening unless it's, it is within these confines of what I'm expecting. God can reach you in a variety of ways, I encourage you to not limit the way God is going to respond. Stop trying to define it in your mind because that is a way that you can miss it. And I will say, that's a way that I believe Satan 
can get into people's one-on-one relationship with God and destroy things. Well, I'm not hearing from God. I can't tell you how many Christians, like, really, they're, like, digging deep, digging deep, and they'll come to me and they're like, I'm still not hearing from God, so God obviously doesn't love me. I'm like, you're sure that's God and not Satan who's found a way to drive a wedge in between your relationship and get in your ear? That sounds like Satan, not God. So conversational prayer for some of you is that edge. I think God's asking each of us, where, where is that edge that we keep maybe like touching a toe, but we're not going all the way off? He is trying to meet us in our place of resistance. Fasting and prayer for some of you, this is the resistance. When we deprive our bodies of food, and in some ways when people are doing fasting and prayer, they'll, they'll do either just water or some people won't do anything at all. They'll go Jesus in the wilderness style. God bless you if that's what you choose. You do you. Fasting and prayer can push a lot of buttons. It is a very deep level of submission and dependence on God. So this is a great way for you to push those edges, but I am asking you today to be prayerful to have God reveal to you where your edge is. Where do you need expansion? God wants us to acknowledge the way we're currently shying away or limiting our prayer life. We're in a time and place where each one of us, we should be required to make this something that happens daily. If we look at every single person on planet Earth right now, you know, you hear a lot of people in the false light community being like, we need everyone in meditation, man, so we can raise the vibration. I mean, yes. There's a different way to do that other than raising the vibration, man. God is asking all of us to be active in the spirit. Us, Christians, believers, people willing to actually go out and radically share the gospel, radically live out their lives for Jesus. We have to be in prayer. We have to be in the spirit. We can't just be like so into our worldly lives that we forget about how important the spiritual battle is. You can live in the world and not be of the world. You can still drive a nice car, you can have a nice job, but you are required to be active in the spirit, yeah? You can't just be like, oh, I'm just comfortable enough here to not do the other. God needs you to be able to do both. He's not saying like, throw away your job and just go be homeless on the street, but he is saying that you have to dedicate time and energy here. And I want you to also stop trying to color in the lines with your prayer life. God kept showing me this example of how restrictive we are. Where we're like sitting there detailed like, well, my church, everyone prays like this. And I, I only want to look like this. I don't want anyone to think I'm weird. So everyone just tries to color in this drawing like a preschooler. God wants you to forget about all the lines and just be willing to color wherever God tells you to color. Stop caring about anyone else's interpretation except God. So what God is calling each of you to do this week is to change it up. I want you to get out of your comfort zone and prepare for a radical encounter with God and do not care about what you look like. So your encouragement for the next two weeks is be prayerful, Find whatever edge God is trying to lead you to and just let yourself trust fall over that edge. Make it a priority. Make it a daily priority and report back because I really feel that people are going to have a radical encounter with God if you allow yourself to get completely out of your comfort zone. Thank you to everybody online. Please share this message with somebody that needs it and we will see you in a couple weeks. Bye, y'all.